Gaelic clans and their battle cries. Since ancient times, on through the Christian era and up until the total conquest of Ireland by the British, which culminated with the flight of the Earls in 1607, Ireland was not seen as one nation of people, with one voice under one centrally controlled government. Rather, the island was comprised of many clan-based groups, each occupying traditionally held territories and each exercising limited power and sovereignty over their familial domains. There was no concept of the nation of Ireland or the state or the republic in the sense we are used to today. Unlike with the monarchical systems found on the European continent, dominion and the right to rule in Ireland was not confined to the sole overarching ruler, but rather it was conceptually decentralised into smaller portions of influence amongst individual members of a tribe or a family group. This was symbolised in part by the holding of portions of family land. The concept of individual or divided sovereignty can be found throughout Irish historical identity where a free man was once seen to be lord of his own portion. His home was his castle. His personal property was his to dispose of. His lands were his domain and while occupied by him he is king. Early Irish medieval society was structured around an advanced and intricate social order where an individual's grade of status was carefully defined. Though individuals were always seen to be part of their wider clan group and were treated as such under the laws. In like fashion to the tribal structure of the Native Americans, each family group and collection of families occupying a territory were seen to be their own sovereign and independent nation. Each family and their line of descent were seen to be a people of their own, managing family affairs internally, electing their own clan leaders as representatives, sharing the duty of raising good-mannered and honourable children, and each bearing the honour and the burden of the family name on their shoulders. There is no doubt, therefore, that the Irish organised themselves into independent factions which were primarily based on ties of blood and marriage, often influenced by proximity of geographical location, mutual interest in common defence, access to resources, and to respect or forge long-time familial allegiances. And as they lived, so too did they fight. This faction-based self-image and deep connection with defending the family name, the stock and the lands, meant the Irish clans were much too prone to engage in common feuds, wars of vengeance and family rivalries. And it is this sad fact that bears Ireland's greatest historical weakness when it came to defence against the invasion of the Anglo-Normans. Each of these family-based factions had their own schlugarm, or battle cry associated to their family line or tribe, usually derived by the followers of great families or chieftains to act as a, a hue and cry, a rallying call to all able-bodied kinsmen, a cry of war from which its hearers drew an almost supernatural and ancestral strength and courage to fight on. Literally speaking, the word slugarum is derived from a combination of the old Irish word slew, meaning an army, a host, or an assembled force, and garum, meaning to cry, to shout out, or proclaim. As such, we get the combined meaning of the cry or proclamation of an assembled force. Interestingly, it is from schlugarum that the English word slogan is derived, and this gives us a good idea of what it really was. It was the slogan the motto or the catchphrase that identified and marked out one family faction from another on the fields of battle. By the time of the reign of King Henry VIII of England, these family battle cries had become a common feature of Irish society and could be heard ringing out across the land during every pitched battle. So prolific were they that during the tenth year of his reign, Henry enacted a statute to proclaim that no person regardless of their estate, their condition or degree, should use the words, quote, Kram Abu, Butler Abu, or other words like, but to call only on St. George, or the name of his sovereign lord, the King of England, end quote. The cry of Abu, 
is the most common exclamation found among the Irish clans. It derives from the old Irish bua, meaning victory, and its use can still be found in the modern Gaelic valediction bua, meaning grab victory. Other forms of this common cry are hubbub, hubbaboo, lullaloo, and even hullabaloo, a word that has spitefully found its way into the English language to mean a confused uproar or a ruckus caused by a large group of people. Hullabaloo, along with the words hubbub and hurrah, are also said to derive from this same source. Abu was seldom used alone, but rather found connected to some deity, a family name, an ancestral hero, an ancestral headquarters, a traditional occupation, or some special symbol associated with the family faction. So let's take a look at a few examples of these cries. The Shlugardam of the warriors of the great O'Neill clan was Lav Daragabu, proclaiming the Red Hand to victory, in honour of the ancient family symbol still found on the flag of the Ulstermen to this day. The O'Hanlins, who held the traditional honour of bearing the Ulster standard, made the cry of Ard Kuliabu, from Ard Quilla, meaning High Forest, thought to be in reference to the family's customary gathering grounds. In the neighbouring Tir Connell, County Donegal, the leading family would call on their ancestral name, shouting O'Donnell Abu. Similarly, the O'Moores cried Conlon Abu after their own famous ancestor Conal Cairnoch. The O'Heffernins used quote, the right of the scholars to victory, which in Irish Ciart Nasua Abu. The shout of the O'Briens, the descendants of King Brian Baru, was Lav Lauder Abu, meaning strong hand to victory. The O'Sullivans of Munster used Lav Forstenach Abu, meaning restful hand, while the Megillah Padricks used Gar Lauder Abu, or the sharp and strong. Descendants of the Fitzgeralds of the Southern Desmond line, originally Anglo Normans who had adopted Irish ways, becoming more Irish than the Irish themselves, would call out Shandid Abu, in glory of the Old Place, their fortified round hill base located in the Limerick Mountains. If you want to find out more about these sorts of topics, visit the site brettonlawacademy.ie, where you will find a number of blog posts and useful resources covering all sorts of information related to early Ireland. You should also check out our online courses, Irish Mythology, and Ancient Ireland Culture and Society, which you can find the links to in the description section. And one last thing before you go, if you enjoyed this video and you want to hear more of this content, please hit the subscribe button so you'll be the first to know when we upload new videos. Thank you for listening. Mm -hmm.